All right, and we are recording. And so good evening, everybody. My name is Kenneth Hoffman. I'm the director of, uh, I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience, soon to open in New Orleans, Louisiana. So happy to have you here tonight for a very wonderful program. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of friends um, and followers here with us tonight, and we're also on Facebook Live. This program is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, at basically, I think tomorrow, if I can, if I can get my act together. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, share my screen because I'm going to uh, put up this slide. Um, there's a lot of ways to explore the Southern Jewish experience. Last month, we did a wonderful program with Richard Nugas. We talked about his father, Herman Nugas, who was a sprinter, world-class sprinter at Tulane University and was invited to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And he boycotted them because of what was going on in Hitler's Germany. And so we talked about, um, so it was a sports themed program. And we've talked to other people about growing up in the Mississippi Delta and growing up in Selma, Alabama. We've talked about what it's like to be a Jew in Texas. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to talk about approaching Southern Jewish history and culture and, and the Southern Jewish experience through uh, literature. And this isn't a brand new thing. You can see from some of the books I'm showing here that um, authors, Southern writers uh, in particular have spent uh, a good deal of their uh, ink on Jewish characters or Jewish themes. And these are just a few of the authors that have Jewish characters in their books or Jewish themes. Jews are generally depicted, particularly um, older in older books as sort of a, a mythical, magical um, creature who, who dispenses wisdom, isn't really black, isn't really white, but is able to um, span the, the racial differences in a community. Um, and so, uh, so this is another way to experience the Southern Jewish history. And uh, let me let all these people in. All right. So, um, so tonight I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and instead, I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. And our speaker is Julie Sternberg. Julie is the award-winning author of the best-selling Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie, its sequels like Bug Juice on a Burger and like Carrot Juice on a Cupcake, the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine middle grade series, and a forthcoming book that we will be talking about tonight. And you will have a chance to pre-order it if you wish. Um, and also the picture books Bedtime at Bessie and Lil's and the wonderful Puppy, 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 which I believe is about a puppy. <laughs> Possibly three. Her books have received many accolades, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie is a Griffin Award winner and a Texas Blue Bonnet Award finalist. Like Bug Juice on a Burger is a Griffin Honor Book, a Pennsylvania Young Readers Choice Awards nominee, and an Illinois Monarch Award finalist. And Like Carrot Juice on a Cupcake was named an Amazon Best Book of 2014 for kids age six to eight. The Juice series as a whole has been named to the Bulletin of the Center for Children's Books Stellar Series list. Not easy to say. Before <laughs> becoming a writer, Julie worked as a public interest lawyer. She graduated from Princeton University with highest honors and holds a JD from Harvard Law School and an MFA in creative writing from the New School. And now I feel like I haven't accomplished anything, but that's okay. Um, welcome, Julie. Um, I think it's time for you to say hello to everybody, and I'm going to spotlight you. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kenneth. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and um, I hope that y'all don't get sick of me talking, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about my writing and about how I've tried to capture... Uh, my Southern Jewish childhood uh, in, in a book. So let me share my screen and here we go. 
So I've started writing books for children about 12 years ago. And from the very, very start, I wanted to write a novel for children that was grounded in my own childhood, growing up Jewish in Baton Rouge in the context of my family. And it turned out to be really hard uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so time passed and I wrote eight other books that were not about that. I wrote um, this series, the, the Juice series for kids ages six to nine. I wrote the Top Secret Diary of uh, Celie Valentine series for kids eight to 10. I wrote picture books, as Kenneth mentioned, for younger kids. And um, I kept, in between each of these books, I kept trying to, in the, I kept trying to write drafts of a book that told my, the story of my Southern Jewish childhood, or at least elements of it. And I kept showing these drafts to my editor and she kept saying, no, this is not working. Until finally, 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 I showed her a draft of the book that has become Summer of Stolen Secrets. And she said, yes, this is it. So what is this Southern Jewish story that I so wanted to share? Um, to tell you that, I need to start with my grandmother, Leah. This is a picture of Leah. And I don't know if you can tell from these pictures alone, but Leah is a tough, tough customer. <clears throat> she was always a tough customer. Um, none of us, none of her grandchildren called her granny or gram or anything warm and cuddly like that. She did not want that and it would not have fit her. She wanted to be called Leah by us and we called her Leah our entire lives, um, her, her entire life. Um, she was tough in part because she was born that way and in part because she, she had to be. Um, she was born in Germany in 1904 and in the early 1930s when the Nazis came to power, she was married and she had two young Jewish children. Um, and the Nazis immediately put the family's livelihood at stake. So Leah and her husband, Eric, my grandfather, um, ran the Sternberg family store in Aurich, Germany. And the, this was a little town in Germany, but they had their store and Leah's side of the family, the Knorr's, had their store on the other side of Aurich. So there were these two stores. And the Nazis immediately set about trying to put these stores out of business. And you can see actually in this photograph, this is a photograph of a truck that's parked outside of the Knorr store, Leia's side of the family store. And it says, do not shop in Jewish stores. Um, that's what this says. And you can kind of see faintly over here, that is a, an SS officer, you know, a Nazi officer, and that is a guard dog. And they are there to try to prevent people from, from going into the store and shopping. So one day in the same year, 1933, Leah went to go pick up the, my uncle, Uncle Joe, who at the time was only in kindergarten. They, uh, at the time it was just Uncle Joe and Aunt Enza were my two, uh, my aunt and uncle were born. And uh, Uncle Joe was five and Enza was only three. And so uh, Leah went to go pick up Uncle Joe at, in kindergarten and she got to the school and she looked around the schoolyard and all of the little kids were throwing rocks and she thought it was some kind of game. She just thought it was weird and she didn't see Joseph. And then she realized that the kids were saying Jew, Jew and throwing rocks at five-year-old Joseph in the kindergarten schoolyard. And she saw that the, that the um, teacher was standing arms crossed, leaning against the fence, watching and doing nothing. So she took him home, did not take him back to school. And around the same time, the public schools in Germany, most of them were closed to Jewish kids. And Eric and Leah decided that's it. Like we're, this is not our country anymore. And at the time, the Nazis were letting Jews leave. They hadn't stopped letting Jews leave yet, but they wouldn't let Jews leave with their money. And so Eric and Leah had to try to figure out a way to violate the law and smuggle their money out of Germany um, so that they could have their life savings when they, when they moved. And so they took all these various different steps to try to get their money into Holland where they had relatives and they could set up a Dutch account. And they took all sorts of dangerous steps. First, Eric tried like bringing the money onto a train and he had it on his purse and then he would hide it behind radiators so that when the, the SS guard came onto at checkpoints, he wouldn't have it on him. 
but then he had to leave it one night on the train behind a radiator because someone came on who knew him and he was afraid of being exposed. And so he had to go at midnight with this Dutch relative to the train yard where the train was parked and like do this break in of the train and get his money. So after that, they thought this is not going to work. So they tried hiding the money in his shoes, but you can't hide a lot of money in shoes. So that didn't work. And then they tried sewing it into these um, hides, animal hides that they would send out of Germany as part of their business because the hides were really stinky. And they figured the Nazis won't check too carefully in these stinky animal hides. Um, but that also was, everything was too slow. And finally they figured out some crafty accounting that allowed them to get the money out using their relationship with their cousins. And they got their savings into this Dutch account, finally. Um, and so they decided that it was time to go. But meanwhile, much to their surprise, they had a third child, um, my father. Leia thought that she had had a hysterectomy. She was told by the doctor that she had had a hysterectomy, but apparently not. You know? So my father was born in July 1935 and Eric decided to leave, you know, he needed to go. They, they decided that he would go, Eric would go to the United States and set up a business, leaving Leia in Nazi Germany with a five-year-old, a seven-year-old and a six-month-old on her own. And they had moved out of the house that they were living in because it was too dangerous to be in this freestanding house. They moved into this little apartment above their store because they, they hoped to be invisible basically there. So Eric goes to the United States and first he stops in Philadelphia. He's like, I'll, I'll go to Philadelphia. He had an uncle there who had an animal fur and hide business, but the uncle put him to business salting the hides. So you have to understand that what that means. Like, you've taken the skins off of an animal. So the person who's salting it has to clean like the blood and the fat off the hide and then salt it so they don't get all shriveled up. Well, Eric did not enjoy that. So he left Philadelphia and he went to, to Jackson, Mississippi where his brother, who he hadn't seen in 30 years, 30 years before this brother had been sent by their parents to America to try to make it in America. He hadn't seen him for 30 years. He arrives in Jackson, Mississippi and his Jack and the brother had a pecan farm. Well, it turns out Eric did not enjoy being a farmer in Jackson, Mississippi either. So he writes Leia and he says, I'm done. I like, I, I'm coming back to, I'm coming back. I, I, I can't set up a business here. I don't like it here. I wanna come home, I'm homesick. Well, meanwhile, Leia has seen a Jewish neighbor shot in the street and killed by Nazis for no reason in front of her. She has seen the father of Francis. Heidi, you said you you're related to Francis. Well, Francis was this beautiful blonde child, like a 13 year old girl. And her father, who is uh, Leia's brother-in-law, her father, hugged Francis, like was biking and hugged Francis on, on his way to his store. And because Francis was blonde and looked Aryan, he and, and he did not, he looked Jewish. He was chastised by a Christian woman and later pistol whipped by the Nazis because they assumed that he was hugging an Aryan girl. So Leia is seeing this happen. She's seeing thugs and gangs walking the streets of Germany singing songs about murdering Jews. And she says, you can't come back. Like, do not come back, find a business, make it happen and send for us. So he does, he, he has a cousin in New Orleans. Finally, we're in getting, you know, into the Baton Rouge story. He, he has a cousin in New Orleans, Mel, and he goes to see the cousin and Mel hears about a store on Main Street in Baton Rouge that's become available. And so, um, he decides he'll drive my grandfather over and he'll take a look at the store. Maybe my grandfather can buy the store, you know, and everything will be perfect. Well, my grand here, I'll show you a picture of Main Street in Baton Rouge around that time. The streets are still made of brick. So my grandfather takes a look at this area. He drives around the store. He sees that there are dead end streets. He sees that there's a railroad track, which he considers unlucky nearby. And he sees this cemetery around the corner. And he says, forget it. Like, this is too much bad luck in one place. I'm forget it. And he drives me back to New Orleans. So they drive him back to New Orleans, but everything in the end works out. They, they, 
they make him go back and he reconsiders and he ends up buying the men's department of Gotcha's on Main Street in Baton Rouge. He sends a telegram to Leia, which is the code. It's, he says, I've bought a shirt. And that's the code that she's supposed to get on the, on the boat with the kids and, and come over. Well, if you remember no other story about Leia than this, just remember this one. She has, again, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, well, I guess they're older now, but three very young children. My dad is only 18 months at this point. She gets on the ship to sail away from the Nazis to freedom in America. The Nazis follow her on the boat, on the ship, and they empty her trunk and, and they break apart. They make a big mess. They're searching for money. They're searching for maybe she's hiding something. They make a big mess of all her stuff and they search they take her into the bathroom and they make her put a foot up on the toilet and they search her for diamonds and money. And then they turn to leave and she's on the cusp of escape, right? With these three kids. And she says to them, she gets, <laughs> she points to the mess that they have made. And she says to them, you made the mess, you clean it up. And they did. <laughs> the Nazis repacked her suitcases. <laughs> so then, <laughs> She comes to America and Eric says, I have spent every penny of that savings that we, that we um, smuggled out on the store. You can buy a mop or you can buy a broom, but you can't have both. <laughs> so they have, they have no money left. They have so little money that they can't buy clothes, new clothes for the kids. So, you know, I still have people come up to me who are my uncle's age and tell me, I remember your uncle coming to first grade, second grade in traditional German garb. <laughs> Baton Rouge, you have to imagine, right? It's Baton Rouge and he's wearing his little knickers that come to his knees and his long knee socks. And so that's how little money they had. Um, so then um, it's a small store at the time. It's, it's, it's quite small. It's only a few departments. It has a pot-bellied stove and wooden, wooden floors and they're trying to conserve money. So when they drop safety pens or straight pens or paper clips on the floor, they, they go into the cracks between the wooden floorboards to get them out, to reuse them. Um, but over time, they, uh, it, the store grows and grows and grows. And by the time I'm a kid, the store is 300,000 square feet. And it stretches over this huge, they keep expanding it and keep expanding it. And eventually Ripley's, believe it or not, registers that it's the largest store, the largest building in the world that was originally built as a department store. So it's just, you know, my parents, my, my grandparents, my parents, my aunts and uncles, they're really tremendous merchants. And eventually we have 26 stores in 13 cities across the South. It's the largest family owned department store, uh, the largest family owned department store chain in the country. And Leia is the matriarch. But whenever any one of us says the store, if we say, where are you going? I'm going to the store. Your dad's at the store. Anytime we say the word the store, we mean this main street store. It is like the bedrock um, of our family. And, it's very much part of our family philosophy that wherever we go, we have to remember that we represent the store. So we, we better look good, right? And my mom really did try with me, she, she did. Like I, I had access to the latest trends. You can see me in the middle here. I have this fabulous um, body wave in my hair and also the, the, the necktie, the men's necktie, which is, was right on trend. But it became clear from a very early, very early age that elegance and sort of being put together and wearing clothes well, that is not going to be my forte. <laughs> like I'm not even going to manage to button my pants, basically. Um, and I'm supposed to work in the store too. Like from the age of five, my parents has a, have us working in the store. We had our employee name tags and we would pin them on. I would always pin mine on crookedly and we would go to the store. My parents would be work there working, both of them. My grandmother, Leia, would be there. My aunt, Uncle Joe was there. Aunt Marianne was there. Enza was there. Like the whole family, the grownups would be, would be in the store. And my siblings would 
were really quite good at working. I mean, my sister Deborah was two years younger than I was. She was freakishly good at selling. <laughs> she, she would stand on a little step stool behind the cosmetics counter and sell grown women makeup. You know, she was like seven, you know. Um, she got banned from the departments that's where the employees made commissions as part of their money because she was she was stealing the sales. Um, and my my brother Eric was like practically born with a business suit. I mean, he, you know, he just was born to it. And who knows what Mark was doing? Nobody ever paid any attention to Mark. You can ask him, he'll tell you. But I I was terrible at at work. I just, I did not enjoy it. I, I was too introverted to sell and I was terrible at straightening. You can take a look at this picture. I mean, this child is not going to be good at straightening. Um, but I did like to, I'd like to explore the hidden spaces in the store, like the, the, the stock rooms and the shoe department behind that curtain behind the desk. And we had this wobbly ramp behind the cafeteria that like overlooked these cages of merchandise. I love that part of the store. And every single Saturday when I was supposed to be working, I ended up in the back corner of the book department reading. That is what I did. But it was a second home to me, the store really was. And it was, a, I think a really special place for the community. People would come into the store and they would talk to Uncle Joe especially and they would say, look, we don't have credit enough to buy Christmas presents and all of the other stores in town you know, have told us they won't give us credit. And he would sign a paper or do whatever he needed to do to make sure that they were able to make the purchases they wanted to make for Christmas. That was a very typical story. You know, people would call and say they had a funeral because someone had passed away in their family and it would be after the store's closing time. And someone in my family would go and open the store so that they could get clothes for the funeral. Um, people would come up to my grandfather and this was really an important part really important to my, to my grandparents, especially, but to my whole family, they would come up to him and they would say, we have relatives in a war-torn part of the world, a different country, and we need to get them out. We need someone to sponsor them, to, to say that they'll sponsor them if they come to the United States. And he would say, do you have the form and a pen? And then he would ask them to turn around and he would put the piece of paper on their back and standing there, right there on the floor of the store, he would sign the document to get their relative out. Um, and he, you know, back w back in the time of World War II, he made a real effort to, to get his family out. Um, and one of my, my favorite examples of that is, has to do with one of those Dutch relatives, a relative who lived in Holland. This is Trudy Guidon. Um, Kenneth, you were talking earlier about an Olympic athlete who spoke recently. Well, Trudy was training for the Olympics as a swimmer from Holland for the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and she couldn't go. She decided not to go because of the treatment of the Jews. She was scared to go. To go, She thought they wouldn't let her back out. Um, and she ended up in two different camps. She ended up in Westerbork, which was like a, a holding place in, in Holland for the Jews. And this was the train that would come and it would take Jews to either Auschwitz, usually either Auschwitz or Theresienstadt. And she ended up in Theresienstadt and then she, after, once the Russians liberated the camp and she was lucky to survive, once the, her, her first husband did not. So she was there with her first husband. This is Trudy Guidon, who, um, who married Eric, Eric Guidon in Baton Rouge. But before that, she was married um, to a man named Dolph and he didn't make it. He got put on the train to Auschwitz and, and died. But um, she made her way back to Holland to her home. Her parents also were killed in Auschwitz. And when she was there, a friend said to her, I saw an ad in the National Holland newspaper from someone named Eric Sternberg, who said that he is looking for his relatives, any relatives, aren't you related to Eric Sternberg? Because he will sponsor you to come to the United States. And so she learned about this ad from a friend and she contacted Eric and they brought her over and, and she, she says she landed in, in Baton Rouge. She arrived in Baton Rouge and went to work at the store the next day. So the store really was this kind of source of hope and, and a tremendous um, sort of tie for the community in the way that we think is crazy. You know, we, just, we just don't have it anymore, I don't think. You know, it's not like I can call Amazon and say, I'm having trouble buying presents for Christmas. Would you make sure that I'll get credit? Um, so um, my grandfather, Eric, died before I was born. 
And one story is that, or one, another story that I love is that, you know, he, he too was a stubborn person. And so he was in the hospital and the doctors wanted to keep him there. He knew his heart was failing, um, but he checked himself out of the hospital and he called someone from the store to come pick him up. And they had, he, he told the guy to drive him one last time around the store. And then he went home and he died a few days later. Um, but Leia was very much alive when I was, when I was uh, a kid. Um, she died uh, in her 90s. And um, she was very much a force in the store and in the family. All of her kids, all of her grandkids, we all ended up living within walking distance of her house. This is a picture of her house. I, I grew up right across the street. And we would, we would all go to her house after a, you know, a day working in the store. This is my dad and my Uncle Joe working mm. in the store. We would all gather at Leia's. This is her kitchen table. And uh, she would serve us, she would serve the grown-ups tea and she would serve us all her, butter, her homemade butter cookies. She was a tremendous cook, um, her homemade butter cookies. And she would serve the kids, I, I remember this to this day, Klein Peters dark chocolate, like this really rich, thick chocolate milk mm. that was just, you know, like a day's worth of calories. And um, we would have that at Leia's. All the cousins were there, Joanna, Katie, and Jay, and Lily, and, and Eric. And we would all, we would all just gather there. Um, and so, um, and we would, we would talk, you know, Leia would initially sort of tell us whether we had gained weight, you know, we would walk in and she would tell, she would say, you, you have gained two pounds. And she was always like, right. She was just perfectly accurate. You know, she, if she said you had gained two pounds, you had gained two pounds. She just, she had an unerring eye. And she would tell you, you know, your mother should not have bought you that dress. It does not suit you. Don't wear it. You know, she was very, very honest, but we loved her anyway. It was this, uh, you know, we adored her and the house felt full of warmth and love, even though she was really um, brutally, brutally honest with kind of a emphasis on, on br brutal. <laughs> um, and so I have to say that I was, I've always been very interested in that, like how you can have a tough family member and you can sort of come to love them and forgive them anyway. Um, so we would talk, she, she would sort of greet us that way, but we would always end up talking, we would talk about the store, we would talk about her German past, our sort of the family's German past, and we would talk about our Jewish heritage. Um, the Jewish identity in Baton Rouge was really, really strong. You know, I've lived in Baton Rouge now and I've lived in Brooklyn. And in Baton Rouge, um, I've got two members of this class here, I think on this call, my class at B'nai Israel, my religious school class, was the largest in the history of the synagogue. We had 15 people, right, Wendy and Joanna? We had 15 people, we were enormous. Well, my kids, you know, belong to a synagogue in Brooklyn now, and 15 is a pretty bad day for, you know, for the religious school class in Brooklyn. They, those classes are enormous. But I will tell you that the connections um, made in the Baton Rouge, in that Baton Rouge community are really, the Jewish community are much, much stronger. It's kind of a truism that the, that the Jewish Southern community has these, has these rich connections. But, you know, I, I've got bagels, I got bagel stores in Brooklyn. I've got a couple, you know, with an easy walking distance of me. Like there are a lot more Jews and Jewish culture is very prominent in my neighborhood, but the connections um, in the Southern Jewish community really are, are different and quite special. So, so here's, a, um, here's a slide of, this is B'nai Israel on the left and Beth Elohim, which is my synagogue, which I, which I love, and don't get me wrong, uh, in Brooklyn. So um, I wanna say uh, that although the store has been gone, we sold the store exactly 30 years ago. And so it's been gone for a while, but it, I still feel like there are signs of, certainly it haunts, you know, Baton Rouge for me, but that maybe to be to expected, but there, there are signs of it. The building is still there. It's a, a FEMA headquarters, but this is one story I love. Um, this is a building that still exists around the corner from the store. And the origin is, this is a pretty recent picture. The origin story is that my father, 
bought this little building near the store solely for the purpose of having that sign with, this, with the name of the store and an arrow pointing you where to go. Then he sold it, right? So he bought it, he flipped it. And in the contract for the sale, he required that they keep the sign. Now the store has been gone for 30 years. You know, the people who own the building could simply place a phone call and say like, do you mind if we stop refreshing the paint on this sign? But they don't. And I like to think that that's because, you know, they, they too like having these memories of the store. I'm making it up, but I like to think it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to keep reminders of the store too in, in my book. Um, I wanted, a book where a family, where there was a family owned department store. I, I really wanted a book where there was that family owned department store. And for people who remember it at all, you'll, you'll see that the layout is the same. You know, it, it is that store, um, but it's set in, you know, in the 2000s. So uh, it's not called Gotchaws, but it is that store in my mind. I wanted it to be run by a difficult grandmother who lives across the street. I wanted the main character to work in the store as a kid and to explore its hidden places. I wanted her to come to love and forgive this difficult family member. I wanted her to embrace her Jewish heritage. Um, and I wanted her family and, her, and Judaism really to give shape to who she is. So that I think I've, I hope I've succeeded in doing in Summer's Stolen Secrets. So why was it so hard to write? I'll tell you one reason it was so hard to write. The Leia character kept taking over the story, <laughs> very true to form. You know, she was domineering, you know, kind of dominating the story. And, and you can't have that in a children's book, like in a, in, a, in a novel for 10 to 12 year olds, which this is, the main characters, like the most powerful characters are real, the primary characters really have to be kids. You can't feel like the primary character is a grandmother. So that was one problem that I had. The other is it, you know, it's often hard to, to write when you don't have enough distance. So there would be problems with me feeling like, oh, you know, this, if I was writing myself too much, which I initially was, then I was like, oh, this character is boring. Who cares about this character? Or if I was trying to inject conflict and tension into the story, which you have to do, you can't have a story with no conflict or tension. No, would, no one would want to read it, but I would have be injecting conflict and tension into this family that felt too much like my family. And then I would get afraid that people would be mad at me. <laughs> so I had to figure out a way to distance myself from the main character. And what I ended up doing is the main character grows up actually initially in Manhattan. And she has this grandmother who's mad at her father, the grandmother's son, because he's married someone who's not Jewish, which is not my experience at all. But it, it, it led to, her, I think, a really interesting dynamic in the book, sort of thinking about why it would be so important to this grandmother that her family marry someone who's Jewish and how both sides of these, this question, you have this very happy interfaith couple with a very, you know, with a daughter and a very loving and healthy home on the one hand. And so that's presented very positively and also trying to come, come to kind of have an understanding of why this woman would be so opposed to it. And the secrets that the girl finds in her grandmother's store when she goes to visit are what helps her, it's their secrets having to do with the grandmother's German past. And they help her to understand what happened and how what happened in Germany has made this view of who her child should marry and the continuation of the Jewish faith so important um, to the grandmother. So, and by the end of the book, they, they all have to come to kind of, they come to an agreement and the daughter, the main character is able to heal them because of these secrets that she finds, she heals the family. So, um, I also just want to say really quickly, if you want to know more about any of the details of the past, the German family history, and also the store's history, my dad has written this nonfiction account um, that would tell you more. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Oh, no, should I stop sharing? There's a little more, Kenneth. Well, I mean, um, I'm going to, um, yeah, stop sharing. 
Okay. But I'll ask you to start sharing again in a minute okay. uh, because I've got some questions for you and some other folks may have some questions for you. Um, okay. Question number one, Katerina, is yes. she you? Is she uh, based on you or on, on one of your cousins or? or <laughs> well, if you like Deborah? her. Deborah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you like her, she's me. If you don't like her, she's Joanne. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she's, <laughs> she's, um, she is, uh, I would say she has elements of me definitely because of my background, but, but because of, because she's growing up in Manhattan and she's dealing with all of those issues of being in this private school in Manhattan, her friends have turned on her and she's the child of a uh, interfaith family and whatever. It turns out a lot of times that just these circumstances turn, a, you know, they really shape a character. And so you can sort of have an initial view of what someone might be, or you can sort of start with a base of, oh, you know, she's someone who's going to work in a department store. And then these other factors sort of take her in a completely different place. So I would say she's herself. Yeah. Okay, good. I have, I have one more question and then yeah. I want to hear from some, uh, some of the other folks who may have questions for you. And that is at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience, we, we like to say you don't have to be Southern and you don't have to be Jewish to come and visit us once we open and, and get something out of, the, out of the experience, learn something about the South, learn something about America, learn something about yourself. Um, uh, and, and it's really important to us that that's what happens because we're not gonna survive off of Southern Jews coming in the store, you know, into the uh, museum only. Um, who is this book for? Oh, and that's a great question, what, yeah. And what do you hope that the young readers and maybe their parents who may be reading along with them you get out of this book? Yeah, well, I mean, I have reached out to every Baton Rouge fourth and fifth grade, well, librarian, the librarians of every school in Baton Rouge that I can find information on, because I would love for every Baton Rouge kid to read a book that's set in their hometown about a kid who's growing up in their hometown about a, with a, a very small slice, but a slice nonetheless of Baton Rouge history. Um, and great if they learn a little bit about Judaism and about the Holocaust. And um, so I, I would love that. So I'm focusing on, on that in part, I'm focusing on Southern Jewish, you know, avenues to reach people in that community as well. And then I just hope people, you know, I'm reaching out also to educators with whom I've had some kind of connection over the years because of my other books. And I'm hoping that if people like my writing, they'll like this story. I, I think it's a great story. I mean, I, I try to read, as I'm sure everyone does, about all different kinds of folks from different backgrounds. And, um, you know, all the better if they're different from me and I, can empathize with them and relate to them in some ways and learn something in others. So Robin, thank you. That was a great answer. Robin is asking why was the store called Gotchaws instead of Sternbergs? Oh, that's a and, great uh, question. And the difference, yeah. uh, of course, the difference is you. Um, <laughs> and maybe Hans or Donna may want to uh, chime in with uh, an answer. I sure. can see them there. <laughs> Why well, was the store Godshaw's? Because the Godshaw family of Baton Rouge, with a U, founded the store in 1904. 1907. See, we're never on the same page. 1907. And when Mr. Sternberg came to Baton Rouge on his first trip and left because of the cemetery and the railroad tracks, the Godshaw family desperately wanted to sell the store and they came after him in New Orleans and brought him back. And by the way, he couldn't speak a word of English at that point. He was studying English at night and they brought him back and they made a deal and they kept the name Godshaw's. Which was the original name of the department what, store. Was there ever a a thought to change it to Sternberg's? No, I don't, not that I know of. I don't think so. I, well, that's not true. 
my father did actually uh, print some stationery using Sternberg as the uh, head of the, the top of the stationery. And then changed his mind. It was an established store. Why, why toy with that? And so he didn't. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you remember that I worked for you in the summer of 1985? I don't know if you remember that, but uh, sales were terrific. That's right. You <laughs> tried the boys' clothing department folding t shirts. That's right. Mostly I was folding, mostly folding, yes. But uh, <laughs> great. I'm a great folder to this day. My wife compliments me on my folding ability, and it's because of my summer at Gotchos. Good so, training. Yeah. I never learned how to fold. <laughs> we could so, never find it. we were always reading in the book department so um there's something else that i just wanted to to for i guess maybe hans or donna to to i, I remember getting I, was it dimes was it a dime for every a oh, for or a nickel, nickel. later it was the dimes inflation inflation yes yeah so tell, we, tell tell everybody about that special uh, offering y'all did well, it was a little a little unique not totally unique but in baton rouge we started giving uh, a nickel for every a on a child's report card and it took off <laughs> the kids would you you once they got their report cards they had to come to god jaws and get their nickel now remember, this was when you could buy Coca-Cola for a nickel. Mm -hmm. You could ride the streetcar or the bus for a nickel. So a nickel meant something. Go to a movie. You could go to a movie for a dime <laughs> well, and we get, a, the, we get a bag the, of pop. Um, a Coke was a nickel at the store for a lot longer than it was a nickel elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. It was such a, it was a reputation maker. And we used to have people come in, they were having a party that weekend, they would fill up with all of our nickel Coca-Colas, which was low cost, <laughs> but they, they, we let them have all the Coca-Colas, the nickel that we had. <laughs> Well, for those for those of you who are not from Baton Rouge who are on, you can definitely see from from Julie's stories and from Hans and Donna's stories that Gotcha's was a wasn't just a store; it was really a, a, a integral part of the Baton Rouge community in so many ways. Um, Deborah has a question, and she says, um, "COVID permitting, are you planning to come to Baton Rouge to promote this book?" <laughs> yes, I it's, I'm. It's my first trip. I was supposed to come in April um, to do some, you know, like look for old photographs and uh, think about things more. And uh, I wasn't able to come because of COVID. I, I can't wait to come. I would love to be there to promote it. Excellent. Well, and and with with that, I in the chat I have put. We're working with a local bookstore here in New Orleans called Octavia Books. Um, and y'all, Amazon is a wonderful thing for getting stuff delivered right to you. But anytime you can support a local bookstore, I definitely encourage you to do that. So Amazon, um, so Octavia um, is accepting pre-orders for the book. The book's coming out when, Julie? Until May 11th. Yeah. Okay, May 11th. If you have um, children, if you have grandchildren, if you have great-grandchildren of this age, which is, what did you say it was? Age? 10 to 12, 10 to 12, 10 to 12, 9 to 12. Yeah. What a great, uh, what a great uh, thing would be to get that book. And Julie has even said she will do a little inscription in the book for you, as long as it's not like another novel. Um, <laughs> and when you go to the Octavia book site uh, in the comment section, if you wanted Julie to say, you know, to write, you know, to, to Barbara <laughs> from Julie or whatever, then you could do it there. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, oh, here, um, uh, Carol has a question and she is asking, I guess either you, Julie, or you folks, what is the connection to Maison Blanche? So a little more store history, take yeah. it away. So in the early 1980s, um, we bought the four Maison Blanche stores in New Orleans. So the, the whole store chain became Gotcha's Maison Blanche. 
Um, gotcha. Hope I got that right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, will you will you share again the PowerPoint so that I can show these last couple of yep. slides? Yeah. Do you want me to go to the next one? Yeah. Uh, okay. So there, if, if you didn't get the chat, um, I know this is kind of hard to write down. Um, so it's better to grab it out of the chat. But um, this is the Octavia book books link that goes right to pre-ordering Summer of Stolen Secrets by Julie Sternberg. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. And this is something that you can do if you are not already receiving the museum's newsletter. Uh, we call, it's called the Southern Schmooze. Then you can sign up for it at msje.org slash contact. And you will get a monthly, and once I hire some staff, possibly even a weekly email um, about what's going on at the museum and some Southern Jewish history and other programs that we're doing. Uh, and if you'll go to the, 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 the next and last slide. Uh, so there's a picture of our building. We're uh, actually only on the ground floor and half of the second floor, but that's our building in New Orleans. Shalom, make yourself at home is our tagline. We want people to um, be welcome. It's not a stodgy place. It's a welcoming place for everybody to come and learn, to have conversations, to socialize. Uh, it's gonna be a wonderful place once we open. The question always is, when are you opening? And uh, we're really hoping that sometime later this spring, um, COVID uh, dependent, we hope to uh, open the museum. But if you sign up for the newsletter, then you'll know for sure, you'll be one of the first to learn about that. And if you believe that this museum is a good thing to have and you wish to support the effort, then you can go to msje.org slash support and um, send some nickels our way, uh, maybe dimes now because of inflation. Okay, so uh, you can stop sharing now, Julie. Um, and whoa. What happened? I'm not sure who, ah, there you go. Well, this has been wonderful. Uh, I've, we've really enjoyed getting to hear about how, um, how you can uh, explore the Southern Jewish experience through reading a book or through writing a book yeah. or hearing an author talk about writing a book. Right. Um, yeah. My sister has been reminding me. I think it was by accident. Sorry. Okay. I'm fine. Are you okay? Again. Okay. In early August, yeah, in early August, um, the East Baton Rouge Parish Library is going to have a walk down the memory aisle event. So um, it'll both commemorate just the, you know, gotchas and, uh, and also the book. And if you have any store memorabilia or store memories that you want to bring, um, it'll be really, I think it's going to be really fun. So again, COVID permitting, uh, I'll be there uh, at the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. I believe it's August it's either the first or the third, I'm sorry, but just a heads up, start collecting your store memorabilia. Wonderful. And if you have, if your family had a store in the South, if you're Jewish and your family had a store in the South um, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, um, and you have a picture of, of the store, or even better yet, a picture of the propri proprietor standing in front of the store or in the store, let me know. Um, you know, send it to me, uh, to my email, um, and it may wind up in the museum. I'm at Kenneth at msje.org. Really easy to remember. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful. This will be on our YouTube channel, hopefully by tomorrow. Everyone take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was wonderful.